All right, hello everyone, and welcome to the Global Nomads Group Pulse Program, Girl Rising. And on behalf of Bridges of Understanding and Global Nomads Group, I'd like to welcome you to this broadcast. Um, so today we are going to discuss girls' education worldwide. My name is Nicole. I am the program coordinator at Global Nomads Group, and I will be your facilitator today. I'm so excited to have our three wonderful high schools joining today as ambassador schools. If you can all just give a quick wave real quick. Wonderful to see you all. So good morning and good afternoon. And then we have our guest speaker as well who will introduce himself very shortly. Um, I would like to also give a quick shout out to our participant schools. We have Kelly as our from Global Nomads Group as our chat facilitator for today. She's going to be guiding the questions and comments in the Q&A box to the right of your screen if you're viewing. Um, so please make sure as participant schools you introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, what school you're connecting from, and make sure to get your questions and comments in as soon as possible. Throughout this hour-long broadcast, I'm going to be taking your questions and comments from the participant schools to make sure that we're engaging all um, one another. So let's go back to the ambassador schools. If I can have each of you introduce your school, um, just have a representative say your name, where you're connecting from, the name of your school, and why don't you also mention something that you learned about access to education or girls' education in particular. So I want to go ahead and start with Gray New Gloucester High. Please go ahead, unmute your microphone, and introduce yourselves. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gabrielle Martineau. We're connecting from Gray, Maine at Gray New Gloucester High School. Um, something we learned is that there are like 66 million girls that are like affected by lack of education. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Gabrielle, for introducing your group there at Gray New Gloucester High in Maine. Can we please now move over to Tallwood High School? Thank you. Hello, my name is Alex Herenkov. Um, this is Tallwood High School in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Um, there are currently 27 people in this classroom. And uh, we were quite shocked at what we saw from the film about uh, women's education and how guess, poorly or how poor it is in um, LDCs around the world. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Alex, for introducing your group and telling us a little bit about what you've learned. Could we please now go to Dahiyat Al Rashid School? Please introduce yourselves. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Kundus. Uh, we're from uh, Dahiyat Al Rashid School. I'm Nan Jordan. Uh, we are four students today. We have uh, Iman and Aya and Shahid. And uh, what I learned was uh, ge is that gender is one of the biggest reasons why girls are denied an education. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Mundas. I really appreciate you introducing your school and telling us again a little bit about what you've learned from the activities and the film. So last but not least, I'd like to bring in our guest speaker now, Mr. Yellen. Could you please introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your role in um, this film in particular and what you've done thus far for about two years now. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, my name's Tom Yellen. I uh, run something called the Documentary Group. It's a company here based in New York that produces documentary films. Um, for a long, long time, I was um, a pr an executive producer at ABC News. Um, and about 10 years ago, um, moved from working inside a network to having an independent company to make documentaries. Um, 
And one of our very first projects that started about seven years ago was an investigation into strategies for trying to attack extreme poverty in the world. Um, and in the course of doing research for that project, what we discovered is that there is one thing that seems to have more impact than anything else, and that's investing in girls' education. Um, and we were so compelled by the data that we discovered that we figured that we should try to find a way to tell that story. And that's really how Girl Rising um, began. We took a long time to do the research and then um, an even longer time to figure out a creative approach that we thought would uh, be compelling to audiences. Um, and we also and we also took a long time to raise money because making a film like the like Girl Rising um, is an expensive proposition. Um, uh, but eventually we were able to begin and uh, we also developed a number of partnerships with non-government organizations around the world who reach out to girls and have girls education programs on the ground all over the world. Um, and when we put it all together, we were able to produce the film that I hope you guys have seen a little bit of. Um, and, uh, and we uh, distributed it in theaters and eventually on television through CNN here in the United States, but also all over the world. And, um, and, and it's, we've been really pleased and surprised um, and proud of the impact that the film has, has had as part of a much wider movement. Um, I think what you're seeing around the world today is uh, a recognition of what we first discovered for ourselves seven years ago, and that is that investing in girls' education is one of the most important strategies that uh, we can take to try to make the world a better place. Um, so I'm really appreciative of all of you all um, getting together today, and I'd be happy to um, answer any questions you have about the film and about the movement and about what's happening in the world. I mean, um, one thing I'll just add briefly is that um, a week ago I was standing in line outside the White House um, because the President and Mrs. Obama made an announcement of a new program called Let Girls Lead, which is an initiative the White House has created um, to support girls' education using uh, the Peace Corps um, all over the world to um, create and support local community engagement projects around girls' education. And, when we started seven years ago, that was unimaginable. So I think the world has really um, begun to recognize the importance of all of this in ways that are large and small. And, and so it's a very encouraging development in a world that doesn't always have good news. So I'll stop there, Nicole, and happy to do whatever you say. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Yellen. I really appreciate you sharing all the progress that has happened so far since the seven years that you've been working on Girl Rising and this global campaign. Um, I'd like to jump right into questions from our ambassador schools. And again, just a reminder to our participant schools, please introduce yourselves. Tell us where you're connecting from, what school you're connecting from, and get your questions and comments in. In about 10 minutes, I'm going to take a short uh, break so we can get the participant school questions over to Mr. Yellen. So thank you so much. Um, let's jump right into our ambassador schools. Gray New Gloucester High, please go ahead with your first question. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Emily Sanborn, and I was wondering um, what has been done and what is there that still needed to be done to improve education for girls and women around the world? Thank you. Well, that'll, I have, how long do we have? I could, that, for the next five hours, I could talk about that, I suppose. Um, I think uh, the, there are really... Um, three things that matter when you're talking about girls' education. The first is access. Um, there are over 60 million girls around the world who are still not in school, but if you actually look at the data, the access question, the access issue, has uh, there's been a tremendous amount of progress. Over the last 20 years or so, the percentage of girls in school has gone up in almost every country. There are still some countries um, that uh, where the story isn't good, but if you take, for example, one of the most troubled countries, Afghanistan, um, in the past 
12 years, they've gone from a few hundred thousand girls in school to well over two million right now. Um, and Afghanistan is a unique country, of course, but it's an indicative of the recognition that getting girls in school is very important. So, you know, the access challenge is it's not met, but it's but there's recognition that it's important. Um, but the two other things um, that need to happen are where I think the most work needs to be done. One of them is the quality of education in schools needs to improve. Um, it's it's one thing to put kids in school. It's another thing, and you guys know this because you're in classrooms right now. If when you're there, you're learning nothing. If your teacher is illiterate, if this class is way overcrowded, if it doesn't feel like a safe environment, then actually getting in school doesn't accomplish much. And even the data shows can even be a negative um, because then parents feel like putting their kids in school, especially their girls in school, um, costs them in other ways because the girls aren't able to do things around the house. Many girls in developing countries have um, all kinds of family responsibilities and those have to be sacrificed if the girl is in school. So there has to be, uh, there has to be a sense that you're learning something. And in some ways the most important thing is what in the field of girls' education is called completion rates. In other words, girls have to stay in school longer. Um, the longer girls stay in school, the more powerfully that correlates with all the good outcomes that from, come from girls' education. Um, and so I think there's now a recognition among people who focus on this issue that it's not just about getting access to school. It's about creating a quality education experience once girls are there and then having girls stay for quite a long time. Um, the, the data suggests that if girls can stay in school through age 16 or 17, um, they have fewer children, they have better health outcomes, they earn a lot more money, the economy of the community and the entire country improves dramatically. So I really think um, if we're talking about what needs to be done, I think there needs to be a shift in the focus to not just access to education, but also making sure there's a good experience there, that there's quality in the uh, experience, and that girls stay in school longer. And um, when it comes to quality, that's really a function of money. Um, the way you create a better educational experience is by investing in teacher training, investing in building classrooms, investing in the sort of infrastructure that you know those of us in the United States take for granted. The school is well lit safe and so on um, and the teachers are trained and I'm sure you all have outstanding teachers um, and and that's you know that but that's a question of resources so resources have to be devoted to quality and when it comes to completion rates that's really often a kind of cultural uh, change that needs to be made in the in the value of education generally and specifically for girls and the idea that girls should stay in school longer um, if you look on our website, girlrising.com, you'll see a set of uh, uh, you'll see a whole bunch of information about this. You can find out a great deal more. But there are a set of barriers that need to be overcome to keep girls in school. And if there are things that you guys want to do, there are lots of resources there to um, to create those opportunities. So I hope that's a helpful answer. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Yellen, for talking um, a little about you know a, the larger problem of what has been done and, and then further what needs to be done. So thank you so much. And great question coming from Gabrielle at Gray New Gloucester High. Um, let's move on to Tallwood High School. Could we please have a student representative come up and ask another question to Mr. Yellen? Thank you. Hello, I'm Anaya Lewis and I'm a freshman and this is the AP Human Geography class. And I wanted to know if you feel that the obstacles placed on girls' education is more due to culture or economic status. Thank you. Um, that's a great question and I don't think um, there's a perfect answer to that. I think it's a combination of both, but um, I think that the the cultural um, causes are a lot easier to uh, to change than many people think. You know, there's there's the the myth that some there's some sort of um, cultural imperative to repress 
girls regardless of the outcomes that happen when um, girls grow into productive members of society as they have the opportunity to do in many places in the world. That's just a myth. I mean, one of the most interesting and compelling things about um, about girls' education is that change can happen rapidly, extremely rapidly. Um, and that happens across all different cultures. Um, I think the value proposition for investing in girls' education is so profound and the, the change in outcomes for families is so immediate and so significant that uh, any kind of cultural barriers uh, melt away very quickly. And what I, I think it's critically important that, that uh, men and boys be invested in this issue uh, because that's where the cultural barriers often um, pop up. But it's also where they very quickly um, melt away when confronted with, you know, what happens when girls have, you know, the most basic opportunities to become productive members of, uh, of society and earn money and, and so on. So, you know, one of the things that we tried very hard to do in the Girl Rising film, and I hope you guys have had a chance to see it or see some of it, is make sure that we included stories about men um, sort of becoming converted or supporting the education of their sisters or their daughters or so on. Um, in the Ethiopian story, for example, um, the brother of, the, of Azmira is the one who sort of stands up and prevents her from uh, getting married at age 13. So I think uh, the cultural barriers can, can go away very fast when confronted with what happens when girls get educated. Great, and thank you again, Mr. Yellen. And that was a wonderful question coming from Tallwood High School. Thank you. Um, so everyone here actually did see the short clip of Roxana and hear her story, which has a lot to do with what you were just talking about, um, Mr. Yellen, about um, including um, male counterparts in there, males who are accepting of girls' education and, and even more than accepting, but trying to further girls' education. Um, in particular, her father in this case was that such person. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, so I want to go ahead to Dahiad Al Rashid School. If you have a question for Mr. Yellen, please go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, well, hello, my name is Aya. I have a question for Mr. Yellen. Uh, there are two summits for world leaders in 2015. What is the role of world leaders toward girls' education? Thank you. Wow, that's a, that's a great question. You guys are asking excellent questions. Well, I think um, we have, if it's not too sort of high-minded to say so, we have a theory of change around this issue. Um, in other words, we have a sort of uh, way of thinking about how things get moved in uh, on this issue, and it involves uh, sort of what we call a bottoms-up change, grassroots, lots of people all over the world recognizing the value of girls' education and doing something about it, and also a top-down um, uh, approach to change in which world leaders uh, feel the pressure from the bottom up and have recognition on their own of the value proposition around this and what good it will do for the, the people they're leading. Um, and world leaders have a very important role to play. And one of them, by the way, is in your country. Um, Queen Rania of Jordan, those of you who are not from Jordan don't know her, but she's an extraordinary woman. She's been a global leader on this issue from the very beginning. Um, we first met uh, Queen Rania about five years ago when Girl Rising was just getting on its feet. We were, uh, she has taken a very active role in speaking out about the value of education for girls. She also has <clears throat> a lot of programs in Jordan that I'm sure you all know quite well that she's supported to make sure that girls get in school, learn something, and stay in school for quite some time. And um, she has been a global ambassador for Girl Rising. Um, she is currently on the, uh, there, there are these things the UN created about 15 years ago called the Millennium Development Goals, uh, which are designed to provide a framework for countries around the world to do things to make the world better. And in the original Millennium Development Goals, um, there was a whole 
section around education that talked about girls but didn't quite emphasize it. Um, but it has provided a framework for a lot of countries to make investments and to be held accountable for what they do when it comes to education. They, the, they expired, or they were meant to be met, I should say, by 2015, the year we're in right now. And so there is a new set of goals being created because not everything was accomplished. The world is still somewhat imperfect. Um, and these are called the Sustainable Development Goals. If you hear people talk about the SDGs, if you follow global policy, that's what SDG stands for, the Sustainable Development Goals. And Queen Rania is one of the world leaders who is helping to write the Sustainable Development Goals around education. And um, what she and her group are doing are, is following the design that I spoke about in my last answer. They're not just focusing on access to girls' education, they're focusing on quality and completion rates. And I think what global leaders can do is first of all talk about this issue and point out how important it is for um, their own countries, but also uh, devote resources to it. You know, talk is is one thing, but actually spending money and changing the way that uh, countries and, and big corporations and you know other global um, institutions uh, invest in girls' education is is really important. And and you know. I think what you're seeing is is leadership on this issue that's significant. It's a very different landscape than it was when we started seven years ago. I mentioned a moment ago that um, that there was a, an event at the White House last week in which the United States announced an initiative called Let Girls Lead. And seven years ago, there, the United States was nowhere on this issue. There really wasn't a lot of issue, uh, leadership. There weren't resources. There wasn't a plan. Uh, there wasn't a recognition that uh, a lot of the things that uh, that need to be done in girls' education, uh, the United States could take the lead on. Um, so I think there's momentum. I think it's a positive thing. Um, and, you know, I'm so pleased that um, that you all are here from Jordan. Uh, please, when you see Queen Rania next, I'm sure you guys are close friends with her, um, tell her I said hello. Wonderful. And great question coming from Aya over at Dahiyad al-Rashid. Thank you so much. Um, so we're just going to take a quick pause and get some questions and comments in from our participant schools. So shout out to all the Youth Talk schools that are participating today. Um, thank you so much. And this one comes from the al A School in Palestine, um, who is a Youth Talk participant. Um, we have some 8th and ninth grade students who want to know, um, as we know the stories are about the real girls, where are the girls whose stories are shared in the Girl Rising movie today? Uh, do you follow them or do you follow up with them? So Mr. Yellen, if you could tell us a little about, bit about the girls who are portray portrayed by other actresses in the film. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the question to mean if I could, Nicole, that, uh, you know, sort of generally where are all the girls, there are nine stories in the film and I'll just speak to generally some of them and uh, to, to all of them and, and a few, a couple of specifics. So um, first of all, the way we found the girls that are participated, that you see on the screen is that we worked through some uh, non-government organizations to meet a whole bunch of girls in the countries that we, um, we told stories from and ended up with a group of five or six and then we uh, showed those five or six to the female authors that we had chosen to write the stories about them and the authors chose the girls themselves um, and then we put the authors and the girls together and the authors wrote about the girl that she had chosen and then based on what was written we um, we then went and shot the story and in some cases we shot the actual girl um, and and and, and in, uh, that's certainly true in, in India for example um, and in some cases, in two countries, Egypt and Afghanistan, we felt that it wasn't safe to show the real girl, so we used actors to portray the girl's stories. And in the case of the India girl, Roxana, um, she uh, played herself, and her sisters played her sister, but her parents were actually played by actors. Um, so we created a script, and this lovely little 10-year-old um, girl became an actress in which she was acting out her own life. Um, 
one of the questions we really wrestled with when we were making the film is, you know, how can we tell these girls' stories without fundamentally turning their lives upside down and creating enormous problems for them after we left? Because we were only going to be there telling their stories for, you know, a couple of days or a week or two using cameras, and then we were going back to Los Angeles, in this case, to edit the film, and we didn't want to leave behind a void. Uh, so we really, really wrestled with that. We felt it was important to support the aspirations these girls have to get educated in some way that was meaningful. Um, and at the same time, we didn't want to turn them into little movie stars so that their lives would be distorted by that whole experience. And it's been challenging. Um, we didn't want to intervene so much that we made it harder for them, but we also, as I said, wanted to support them. So what ended up happening is one of our... Um, partners in the Girl Rising project has been the Intel Corporation and Intel agreed to create a fund to support these girls in their educational aspirations throughout their lives. So we're attempting to follow all of the girls and we're uh, through Intel we're paying the costs of their continuing education all the way through graduate school if they choose to do so. And in some cases um, that's working really really well. Um, uh, Roxana is in school. Her family is not does not live in a regular home. It's a very tricky situation for us. We're not. Uh, it's not clear what our real uh, role should be with Roxana. Her family is still living, for the most part, on the street in India. Um, we check in with her a lot. She's she's associated with an NGO in India. We have a pretty good sense of what she's up to. She's an extraordinary girl continuing in school, um, and we're hopeful that she'll be able to sustain that and she'll have the support she needs. Um, there's a girl, if those of you who saw the entire film, the girl from Peru is now in college. She was living on top of this mountain at 17,000 feet in completely impossible circumstances, but she's managed to make it into college, and she's thriving, and she's writing poetry, and it's really extraordinary. Um, there are a couple of stories that aren't where the outcomes so far are not as hopeful. For example, um, the girl in Egypt who uh, we couldn't show on the screen because it was too dangerous. Um, we've lost touch with her. She sort of dropped off the radar, and we actually don't know what's happened to her. We're very, very worried about her. Um, and so, you know, it's a mixed set of outcomes so far. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's been hard for us to figure out what the best approach should be beyond making sure that we support the opportunities that these girls can, um, can you know, get access to to continue edu their education. Um, the girl in Haiti, if you saw the Haitian film, um, is an extraordinary eight-year-old girl who also portrayed herself in a script written about her life. And about a year after the film came out, um, the Secretary of Education, a guy named Arnie Duncan, who works in the cabinet of the United States of the, for the president, was going to Haiti and his office called us and said that he wanted to get away off the beaten track and he had seen Girl Rising and he wanted to meet Wadley, is her name. Um, and so we organized a meeting between the United States Secretary of Education and 10-year-old girl <laughs> in which he implored, she implored him to for the United States to make a greater investment in girls' education in Haiti. She was there like a lobbyist. It was extraordinary. Um, so, you know, these girls, uh, if they're given half a chance, will do extraordinary things. And uh, we're happy to be able to support it, but at the same time, we're, you know, we recognize that it's a very, very challenging world these girls inhabit, and, um, and we're trying our best to support them. But that's a great question. Yes, so thank you again to the al Tade School over in Palestine. Really appreciate the question, and that is so wonderful to hear about Roxana. So thank you so much, Mr. Yellen. Um, I want to take one more question from our participant schools. We have a question coming from Greenwich Academy in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, the students there want to know, can you please go into further detail of the positive effects that completion of education has on young women's lives in developing countries. Thank you. Sure, sure. And I actually think I have a, a friend of mine who called me this morning. I didn't realize that Greenwich Academy 
was going to be participating, but I'm, I want to say hi to my friend Susanna. Hi, Susanna. Anyway, um, uh, so uh, the, the, the positive effects of girls completing a lot of schooling um, uh, are, are multiple. And I mean, first of all, health outcomes improve dramatically. Um, girls tend to be healthier for longer. Second of all, they marry later. Um, early marriage is one of the most significant barriers to girls getting educated. Um, and it's a, a very destructive experience if you get married when you're 12 or 13 or 14. And then there are a lot of countries in which there are um, actually laws against uh, early marriage, but they are not followed in practice. Ethiopia is a good example. Um, the story in Ethiopia in the film is about a girl who's, who's offered into marriage by her mother when she's 13. And, she, and her mother does it because she thinks the girl will have a greater chance of surviving in a very difficult setting. Um, but the brother stops her from getting married. And, you know, what you discover is when girls um, stay in school longer, um, uh, they earn more money. Um, and as I said, they have better health comes, uh, outcomes. They get married later. They end up having fewer children. Family size correlates very directly with all the you know uh, per capita income and uh, and health outcomes for entire communities. Um, so there, there almost every good thing you can imagine um, is much more likely if girls stay in school longer, and almost every bad thing you can imagine is far less likely if girls stay in school longer. Rates of, for example, um, violence against women, and particularly violence against girls, sexual violence, and other things go way down when girls stay in school longer. Um, so, uh, you know, and the other thing is that it's, it's, it's keeping girls in school longer has a multiplier effect because educated women educate their children, both their sons and their daughters. So this is an, in, the, the effects of educating girls um, last through generations. Uh, so it's, a, it's an incredibly powerful agent of change. Um, and, and, you know, I think all of us have a responsibility to, to support it. Wonderful. Thanks again, Mr. Yellen. And great question coming from Greenwich Academy. Um, so let's go back to our ambassador schools. Um, start again with Gray New Gloucester High. Please feel free to ask another question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rachel Lachance, and I'm from Gray New Gloucester High School in Maine. And our other question was, do you find that even in developed nations that there are less opportunities for female education compared to male education? Thank you. Um, that's a great question. I, I would say structurally, I don't find that. I mean, one of the questions we were asked, when I mean structurally, I think there are laws I mean, let's take the United States, for example. There's no uh, gender bias in the rules around education. Um, so I think structurally uh, that, you know, that problem has been solved for places like the United States and much of the developed world. Um, that's not to say that there aren't ongoing issues around, um, you know, gender equality in all kinds of ways, particularly around, um, you know, equal pay for equal work. And as the father of four daughters, who I hope will support me in my old age, I'm certainly in favor of that. Uh, but also as a person, I think, uh, you know, I'm in favor of that. So, you know, one of the questions we were asked when we were fundraising to make this film is, you know, are you going to tell the story of an American girl? Because we have problems. Girls in the United States have all kinds of problems when it comes to education, uh, particularly with teenage pregnancy and in poor communities and, and violence and poor in lots of places and so on. Um, and, you know, we, um, our response was that we checked with the people who are experts in this field um, and we were told in no uncertain terms that if we included a story of an American girl alongside the stories we were telling about, for example, the girl you guys met in India, it, it would discredit the overall film because there really is an equivalence. I think it's 
while it's important to recognize the need to support girls' education globally, I think it's also important to recognize the extraordinary progress that has been made in some parts of the world, including the United States. You know, we, we just live in a fundamentally different environment. My 12-year-old daughters, I have twins, um, uh, you know, they have every opportunity. They go to a fantastic school. Uh, it's a co-ed school. They are, um, you know, I have tremendous confidence that they will lead rich and full lives, and it begins with the education they're getting right now. And that set of opportunities just doesn't exist in a way that's, you know, structural. There, there are all kinds of barriers that have, you know, that we can't imagine. You know, there are fees for school. There are uniforms that are required. You have to buy books. There are not, for example, in many parts, in many places where girls' education is a problem, there aren't even uh, bathroom facilities for girls. And, you know, so there are just incredible obstacles that seem so basic that are fundamentally different in some places in the world than they are for um, many uh, kids, boys and girls, in, in developed countries. All right, thank you. And a great question from Rachel at Gray New Gloucester High. Thank you so much. Let's move right along to uh, Tallwood High School. If you can go ahead and ask your next question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pedro, and uh, my question is, what uh, specific improvements have happened since uh, girls' education has gotten better? Can you, can you try that one again, Pedro? I didn't catch the last part of the question. I apologize. Uh, what specific improvements have happened since girls' education has gotten better? Since girls' education, you mean in, in, um, in countries around the world that have changed their policies around education? Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah, that, um, sorry, it took me a while to, to hear you clearly there. Well, you know, that's a really good question. I, when one of the, the, the there are no side-by-side -side comparisons that are perfect. But one of the um, sort of set of facts that really impressed me when we were first exploring this is if you look at two countries, if you go back about 60 years and you look at Pakistan and you look at South Korea, um, the sort of data on literacy rates for women and uh, you know completion rates in school and per capita income and all of the normal measures of sort of economic health and uh, you look at death rates, you look at childbirth rates and so on, they were very, very similar in those two countries. Um, but starting really in the 60s, um, Korea, South Korea started to make investments in universal education and Pakistan for, did not. Now there are all kinds of other factors in both countries. Both countries, I mean there was the Korean War back in the 50s that divided Korea um, and, and Pakistan has had incredible challenges that continue to this day. But now the uh, South Korean economy is one of the most robust in the world. The standard of living has gone up extraordinarily in South Korea and Pakistan still struggles and struggles terribly um, in all kinds of ways around security issues and economic issues and health and welfare issues and all of that. Um, and I don't think you can attribute every uh, bit of success that South Korea has had to investing in girls' education or universal education, education for everyone. Um, but that pattern of, you know, countries making investments in access to education for everyone and, you know, economic success and peace and stability and better health outcomes and so on has repeated itself all over the world. Um, China is another good example where um, there are all kinds of prejudices against um, girls in China but not when it comes to education. And so if a girl can um, survive for the first five years in China, which is sometimes not easy um, because there's a preference for boys among parents for some very peculiar reason, um, then the outcomes for girls are extraordinary in China because there's universal access to education there. So, um, you know, I think one of the lessons that, that the world is learning right now is that 
investing in girls' education has such a multiplier effect in every place that it happens that um, it's really important to do. You know, when we were first starting this, we met a, a whole set of extraordinary people. One of them is this woman named Gita Raugupta. She's originally from India, but she's lived in the States for the past 50 years. And she did a lot of research, uh, or her organization did a ton of research about this issue. And so we went to her first to try to understand the data. She's now uh, works at UNICEF. She's the deputy director of UNICEF. And she said to me, she said, you know, Tom, uh, it's not just that it's the right thing to do to educate girls. She said, it's just stupid not to do it. Um, and I think that's kind of sums it up. I, I, it always struck stuck uh, with me what he to said because it's just stupid not to do it. There's there's no argument against making really massive investments in in girls' education, and there's every argument for it. So I hope that answers your question, Pedro. Yes, and a great question coming from Talit High School. Thank you so much. Uh, let's move back to Jordan, um, Dahiyat Al Rashid School. Please go ahead with your next question. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shah. Um, I was wondering about how can we, as educated 16 year, old, 16 year old girls, help in educating girls around the world? Thank you. Right. I, I think, you know. Um, First of all, I think by continuing your education, that helps. Um, I think educating, uh, spreading the message in your community to encourage uh, families that uh, uh, to, conti to continue to educate everyone, boys and girls. Um, I also think that we live in a deeply interconnected world. I mean, look at this. This kind of event, I'm sitting here in my office and talking to you in Jordan, and um, you know that sort of thing has created enormous opportunities for uh, to share the message of the value of, of making investments in, in kids everywhere to get educated. Um, so, and I don't think it's that complicated. I think, you know, I don't, I don't think you have to go out and move somewhere else and dedicate yourself to, you know, uh, to, to focusing on this issue. I think it's as simple as uh, sharing the stories of what happens when girls are educated and and create I mean global movements are are made by people you know sort of making an investment in an idea and doing it when they have the time to participate and what I would encourage all of you to do is is that you know participate but participate in a way that's consistent with the rest of your lives and if you're fortunate enough at some point to have an opportunity to influence how resources are allocated as you get older or uh, uh, you know, or, or have an opportunity to influence policy in some way, or you end up in a career in which you can um, direct the institution you're working with to support the idea of universal education with with a lot of quality and over a long period of time for everyone. I think that would be a valid, valuable thing to do. But I don't think you need to turn your life upside down. I think it's really about um, you know, just being part of a global movement by sharing the message and then doing what you can when you can. I mean, selfishly, I would encourage you to go to the Girl Rising website and look at the things that that we suggest, the specific things that we suggest to support girls' education. But there are lots of organizations working on this now. Um, in the United States, as I mentioned, this White House initiative called Let Girls Learn is a very important thing that's just getting started, and I think schools all over the the United States can support what uh, what that is is starting to do. Um, so I think there are a million things to do, um, and I don't think it's hard. And I think it's, I, I do think it's important. So thank you. That's a great question. Yes, thank you so much, Saha. Wonderful question. Thank you. Um, so I the students here were challenged with a particular task. Um, using a lot of the activities and the curriculum resources on the Girl Rising website um, to really dive into their own community and look at some of the challenges that um, prevent people from accessing education or accessing a quality education. So thinking now about your own communities, 
where, where yes, um, for two of our sites, it's um, or for everyone, it's it's really um, it may not be access um, in terms of uh, economics. It may not be access in terms of culture. Maybe something completely different. Um, but just curious to hear from each of the schools very briefly about the challenge that they might have seen and what they propose to do to overcome this challenge. What kind of campaign have you thought of to overcome this challenge? So thinking about your own community, I want to go to Gray New Gloucester High. Are there any challenges that prevent equal and quality education to you and your community um, or anyone? And what have you thought of to maybe combat this challenge? Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Emily, and we misunderstood the directions of this activity, so we did um, just a challenge that faces girls in different parts of the world, um, and so is it okay if we just share that instead? Okay. Um, so our, 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 is our issue is education and accessibility once it's there. Um, so we had an idea that there could be um, tutors living in communities who travel throughout the community to individual houses to teach um, basic reading and writing skills until there are until the students are able to read textbooks and learn on their own, and then the textbooks could be distributed to further their education. And another idea was that different um, NGOs could come together to support building and running a school that makes more connections between co uh, communities to help keep girls in school. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily, and that's absolutely fine. I love that you did kind of a global approach to this. Let's quickly hear from Talwood High School. Um, what about you guys? What kind of challenges did you look into? Um, after that, we'll hear from Dahiyad al-Rashid, and then we'll give uh, Mr. Yellen some chance to uh, reflect on this. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sydney Odango, and my idea was to um, help people who aren't exactly open to the idea of girls getting an education on a global level. So I was thinking of um, like mini education programs for parents and uh, boys, teachers, grandfathers, and fathers with female daughters, and even government members so that they can see the benefits of supporting a girl's education. And there could be night programs like where girls learn about scholarships and um, the people that run it can be supportive of the idea of girls' education and they can be spokespeople. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. Sounds like some really great ideas coming from Talwood High School and Gray New Gloucester High. Let's go to Dahiyad al-Rashid. Could you please talk a little bit about the challenges that you uh, thought about and what you presented or what do you present as a solution or a way to raise awareness about these challenges? Thank you. Yeah, hello, uh, I'm Maria again. Yeah, I think one of the biggest problems uh, globally is uh, gender uh, inequality, like between boys and girls. Uh, it's a really big problem for some girls around the world, and it's not a, a big issue for boys when it comes to education. Uh, like, uh, a family was uh, given a choice to neither educate a boy or a girl, they will choose the boy instead and they, in some people in some countries think that the, the girl should be at home uh, cooking, cleaning and working and I don't see that this is the right thing, thing to do. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the solutions we thought of is uh, to put laws uh, that protect girls' education uh, and uh, every girl should be educated. Uh, raising awareness, again, is uh, a very important thing. 
and uh, lower the fees and prices of books and uh, uniforms, etc. Thank you. Wonderful. I think these are all really eye-opening facts and challenges that still exist um, for uh, girls' education or access to quality education worldwide. Um, and I wanted to hear from Mr. Yellen a little bit about um, what he thought um, about these, these challenges that were just presented and some of the solutions presented. So go right ahead, Mr. Yellen. Thank you. There we go. Unmute. Um, well, one of the things we learned in the uh, in this seven-year experience with girls' education is that the best ideas come from others. Um, I mean, there there have been extraordinary um, suggestions and actions taken all over the world by people that have encountered what we've done um, and have uh, um, you know. So so I support everyone's ideas. I think it's. I, I don't think. I mean, our role really is storyteller, um, and, uh, and and we hope that our stories are uh, inspire people to act. That was really the intent of Girl Rising from the beginning: is to create stories that encourage people to act. I think, um, as I said a moment ago, to an answer to a previous question, that you don't have to turn your life upside down. But um, but I would also would like to say that I think there are specific opportunities to do things. I mean. If you think, for example, about uh, Jordan as a country, one of the things that's happening in Jordan right now is that uh, the country is being overwhelmed by refugees from the conflict in Syria. Um, and I was in the region um, about a year ago um, in Abu Dhabi, and, and, and I was talking to um, an extraordinary woman there who's actually from Jordan, and she, was, she had spent some time in the refugee camps. And one of the things that's happening in the refugee camps is that um, you know, girls are being trafficked uh, intentionally. In other words, they're being essentially sold into slavery um, uh, for in ways that are horrific. Um, and so, you know, there are some really sharp issues that I think can be addressed directly um, by uh, by everyone who who choose to focus on them. Uh, so, if you if you really have a deep interest in going beyond just sharing the general story of girls' education. I think one way to do it is to look at some of the more stressed places in the world, like the refugee camps in um, in Jordan and in Lebanon and and so on, that are uh, a result of um, the conflict in Syria, and and see which organizations are doing important work there, and then really reach out and supporting them. I, my my best suggestion about what to do that's specific is to do a, a little bit of research around organizations that are working on the ground in, in ways that really make a difference um, and then and then uh, supporting them. The, the point being that <clears throat> you don't have to reinvent the wheel if you want to devote yourself to this issue. There are hundreds, maybe thousands of very compelling things that are happening right now around these issues with organizations that are very reputable. Um, and the suggestions we heard a moment ago from these students are terrific, um, and they can be complemented by doing a little bit of work to find out what you might do yourself to support organizations that are already doing important work on the ground. Great. Well, thank you all so much. We only have about five minutes left. So I wanted to see, uh, Mr. Yellen, did you have a question that you wanted to present to the students here today, um, both the ambassador schools and our wonderful participant schools as well? Thank you. Yeah, I do, actually. Uh, thank you, Nicole. I mean, my question is really about boys. Um, I'd love to hear whether how, these, how the students here, and I noticed there are uh, uh, some boys at the uh, high school in Virginia, which I'm happy to see. Um, I don't see any in Maine, so I don't know. Where are the boys? <laughs> oh, there is one. There's one. Hi. Um, but I'd be curious to know uh, what the girls and students uh, think their male counterparts, um, how they would feel about this. And I'll preface the question by saying um, that one of the things we were asked often and are still asked is why are you focusing on girls' education? Why not boys? And 
the short answer is that if you educate girls, the boys come along for the ride. So we're not ignoring boys, and as a former boy myself, um, obviously I believe in boys' education too, but uh, the way you get more boys in school is to get more girls in school. Um, but I'd be curious about um, male attitudes among uh, students around this issue and generally around gender equality. So if people could take that on, I'd really love to hear it. Awesome. Great question, Mr. Allen. Thank you so much. Let's uh, again go back, start with Gray New Gloucester High. If we can hear from either some of the girls that are thinking about um, the perspective of boys or any of the boys in the class if they want to be brave and come up and share their perspective. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Emily again. Um, so in our community, I've found that many boys are feel very strongly about um, girls having access to education and women's equality in general. And I think that most of the boys in our community are very supportive of us as women. And I know that I've never um, run into a boy at my school who said, like, you shouldn't be here. So it's really nice that the boys and men in our community are so supportive of us. Gabby? Um, my name is Gabrielle, and in our class we have two boys who are really active in helping us think of um, solutions to, I, to problems and just a really active part in helping out with this situation. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Emily and Gabrielle. Let's go to Talwood High School. Can we hear from, from you guys as well? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello, Alec, again. Uh, I can't really think of one specific thing that boys can do to help out with women's education, but definitely help out with um, the programs, um, volunteering, to help um, and raise, yeah, fundraisers, stuff like that, things that will just, I, I really can't think of a specific thing, like just promoting in general. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Alec, and I really appreciate um, you just joining the program. I think that's a lot right there in itself. Um, kind of going off the question that Dahiyat al-Rashid had asked Mr. Yellen about what they can do as 16-year-old educated girls, I think the same thing goes to educated boys, just being a part of programs like this and uh, standing by your female classmates. Um, so thank you so much. Let's hear from Dahiyat al-Rashid. Um, what do you think about the perspective of boys in your community. Um, do you think that uh, you know they're okay with this, um, or they're they're on your side? Thank you. My name is Iman. Um, I won't say that boys are uh, help us and and they encourage us. Um, my brother helps uh, helps me a lot. Um, I can. Uh, and uh, most of the boys here uh, support education, and and they are uh, a barrier for us. Thank you. Wonderful, and thank you so much. It's so wonderful to hear of um, you know a female with a very supportive family, especially with the male counterparts there. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. Um, so we're going to wrap up in one minute. I just wanted to get any last comments and thoughts from Mr. Yellen. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, I would just want to thank all of you for participating. I, and Nicole, you did a fabulous job. You have a future as a host. I'll look forward to watching you on television going forward. But no, that was uh, very valuable for me. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and questions. Uh, one of the... Um, most wonderful benefits of being involved in this project for me has been um, the opportunity to work with young people um, and, and hear from them and see the focus and the dedication around these issues. It gives me a great deal of confidence in the future that uh, 
older people like me are leaving behind for our kids and our friends like Susanna and Greenwich um, because of what you guys are doing. So I, I appreciate the opportunity and, um, and thanks very much. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, a very special thanks to Mr. Yellen for joining today. I really appreciate everything that you've done uh, thus far to focus on girls' education or access to quality education worldwide. A very, very special thanks also to our ambassador schools. You are all wonderful. You spoke so well, clearly, and I'm just so excited to be hearing from you um, that you're focusing on this topic. Um, and a very special thanks also to our participant schools. We heard from Greenwich Academy and al A School. Thank you all so much. And to our other participants, thank you for joining. Um, again, please go to the Girl Rising website, girlrising.com, for more resources on how to follow up and continue on on this topic. And on behalf of Bridges of Understanding and Global Nomads Group, thank you all so much for joining. All right, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you so much. You can go ahead and, and unmute your microphone and say goodbye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.